and laparoscopy in infertility is of interest to both the gynecologists as well as surgeons. How many gynecologists do we have in the audience? Can I see the hands raised? Oh, a lot many. But still I would say even surgeons are very much interested in this field of infertility. Uh, since this is a very vast topic, I will be touching very briefly upon each and every aspect of hysteroscopy and laparoscopy in infertility. You would all agree with me nowadays with uh, incidence of infertility being on rise, we see a lot of cases in our day-to-day -day practice who require hysteroscopy and laparoscopy. This has become in fact a mainstay in infertility management. Hysteroscopy and laparoscopy gives us a complete insight of the problem and it has the advantage that it is one-step diagnostic as well as an operative procedure. When to advise the patient for hysterolaparoscopy is when we on ultrasound or HSD see a pelvic pathology which needs to be taken care of, be it a cyst or a polyp or a fibroid or if there is a prolonged unexplained infertility or if it is a patient who has failed adequate trial of medical management. Coming first to hysteroscopy, hysteroscopy has now become a gold standard in fertility evaluation. It gives us the complete visualization of the uterine cavity. We can rule out endometrial pathology, look for polyps, septums, ashenmans, corner blocks, myomas, adhesions, and even foreign organs. The various procedures I will be touching upon are polypectomy, myomectomy, septum resection, lateral metroplasty in cases of ashenmans, adhesiolysis, coronal calibration, and foreign body removal. This is something very interesting, foreign body removal. Is, here in India, we do come across cases where we see retained bony spicules, which I will be showing you on uh, one of my video presentation. Now coming to the procedure of hysteroscopy, the key to success to a good hysteroscopy is choosing the right fluid, and choosing the right way to pressurize so that the uterine cavity is distended and we are able to see the pathology nicely. The fluid that we choose should, should have a good optical conductivity, it should have less electrical conductivity, it should be more physiologically compatible. So far there has been no perfectly ideal fluid. The fluid that we use in our practice is number one ringer lactate which we use for all the procedures of uh, diagnostic hysteroscopy. Ringer lactate has got a high electrical conductivity, so it cannot be used whenever a resectoscope is being used. It has a good optical conductivity, it is more physiological, it does not cause hyponatremia. The only thing that it can cause with prolonged use is fluid overload. The second fluid that we use is glycine. It is a very good media to be used whenever electrical current is being used. It has got a high optical visibility. It is a bad conductor of electricity, but it has a disadvantage of being hypotonic and less physiological. With prolonged use, it can cause hyponatremia and fluid overload. Its metabolite is toxic to CNS. While using glycine, we have to be very, very careful. This is one fluid we have to be all be very cautious about, about how much amount is to be used. Our limit for using glycine is 3 liters. When we exceed that limit, it is better to abandon the procedure and it is always better to counsel the patient beforehand that if it is, for example, if it is a big fibroid, that we may not be able to complete the procedure in one go and we may need a second sitting. Repeated serum electrolyte evaluation during the procedure is also helpful. And if the serum sodium level falls on before 120 millimole per liter, it is better to abandon the procedure and take up the case in the second row. Glycine toxicity, well as, as I said, it is a CNS depressant. It can cause nausea, vomiting, agitation, coma, and demyelination syndrome, and even in worse situations, blindness. The management includes giving flusamide. So if it is a case of hysteroscopic myomectomy during the procedure, it is always better to give 20 mg lasix IV to the patient. Increase oxygenation, give hypertonic saline or ringer lactate IV to the patient. And in these cases, anesthetics is as important as the surgery. Now coming to the fluid installation during hysteroscopy, to achieve adequate distension of the uterine cavity, for most of the surgical procedures, we require a pressure of 80 to 100 millimeter of mercury. The capillary venous pressure inside the uterine cavity is 30 millimeter mercury. So for visualization, we need at least more than 40. For majority of the procedures, 80 to 100 millimeter of mercury is 
absolutely fine. The various ways by which we can instill the fluid in the uterine cavity is by using air pumps, pressure bags or hystro bag. During our routine <coughs> practice, we majority of the time use air pumps only which are cheap, easy to use and give good distance. When during hysteroscopy, the complications that we can land up with are uterine perforation, hemorrhage, <coughs> fluid overload and hyponatremia with lysine use, injury to the bowel or bladder if we perforate the uterus and of course embolism. As I said, it is always wise to abandon the procedure if the upper limit of uh, fluid or the serum sodium levels have fallen down has been reached. Complete the procedure in second sitting, like if it is a large submucous fibroid, Always counsel the patient beforehand that we may need second sitting. To conclude about hysteroscopy, I would say hysteroscopy has brought a revolution in the field of infertility. Any infertility workup is incomplete without it. It has the advantage of diagnostic as well as therapeutic. A pre-IVF hysteroscopy is always must. Offers hysteroscopy, lesser invasive, a good choice. And potentially serious complications can occur whenever we use glycine. <coughs> Experienced surgeon and anesthetist are must. Now I'll just show you uh, my video presentation on hysteroscopy. Some of the procedures that I have briefly touched upon. Now you can see the various endometrial pathologies which we can appreciate during the procedure. This was a case of infertility, had dysfunctional uterine bleeding. This is a totally dysfunctional endometrium. You can see the engorged vessels. This is not a normal endometrium. Now this is case number two, where it is a hyperplastic endometrium. Whole of the endometrium appears polypoid. Now this is three, where uh, there are intrauterine adhesions. You can appreciate the adhesions inside the uterine cavity. In these cases, we do lateral metroplasty and create space inside the uterus. Now, this is a case of submucous fibroid. You can see a beautiful fibroid jetting inside. Now, these are two twin intrauterine polyps inside the uterine cavity. Another endometrial <coughs> polyp. You can see these are the pathologies which. Now, this is a case of intrauterine addition. This was a patient who had undergone. Second register MTP in the past. Now coming to the foreign body inside the uterine cavity, this is a case where you can appreciate the bony spicules. These are all the patients who have undergone uh, mid-trimester MTP after sex determination and this is something which is very common in India. These are the bony spicules being taken out. And how much damage it causes inside the uterine cavity if, I, if you look at the endometrium post-procedure, it is all scarred. <coughs> See the, uh, another case where the bony spicules are just floating inside the endometrial cavity. <coughs> this is the damage to the endometrium that you can appreciate at the fundus. Bony spicules being taken out. Now this is a case of coronal cannulation. All the hysteroscopic procedures are very, very rewarding. Many patients, they conceive after a good hysteroscopy. This was a case of bilateral coronal block where we did the coronal cannulation. We can test the patency by doing the concomitant uh, laparoscopy. See this nicely dilated ostia after the cannulation. <coughs> now, this was, this is the hysteroscopic myomectomy. Chip by chip, we are taking out the fibroid with the help of the loop. Glycine is being used and the Fibroid is being chipped off with the help of the loop. What we have to bear in mind, we have to be very fast in doing these surgeries. If we are slow, take more time, more glycine absorption, more chances of complication. 
fast but precise is the mantra. Another case of hysteroscopic myomectomy. Bit by bit, we chip it off and then take it out of the uterine cavity. Are you hurrying up for that little bit? See the uterine cavity um, after the whole myoma is taken off. Nice cavity is being created after the whole myoma is chipped off. Now this is a polyp which we are taking out with a just a unipolar electrode which we have put through the operative sheath. Since in this patient we could not adequately dilate the cervix for the resectoscope to be put in. Now the same addition which you had seen earlier, adhesionizes with the scissors, the hysteroscopic scissors. And again you can see the nice cavity being created. Always we send the biopsy from the area for tuberculosis testing. Now this is a case of septum resection. Small septum you can see. These are the cases which are re responsible for uh, infertility as well as recurrent pregnancy losses. Again a very rewarding surgery. A lot of patients post the procedure, they conceive spontaneously. See the panoramic view of the cavity. Now this is a complete uterine septum being resected. In fact, following septum resections or even adhesiolysis, we do not recommend putting in an IUCD inside. Various studies have shown that it has got no advantage. Leave the patient like that. The endometrium would grow on its own. In fact, I came across, I came across a study where they had done hysteroscopy following septum resection at two weeks interval, two to weeks interval each, and they could see the endometrium growing nicely over the resected area. So no need to give, um, uh, no need to put in an IUCD. Neither there is a need to give uh, high dose estrogen and progesterone to the patient. The endometrium grows on the resected area on its own. In fact, six to eight weeks down the line, if we do a check hysteroscopy, we can't even make out that this was the place from where we had done the, where we had done the resection. One should, in between, uh, take a panoramic view to see that the cavity is nicely created. Whenever in doubt, it is always better to leave a little septum than to go overboard and <laughs> dig into the myometrium and then land up with uterine perforation or leave the fundus weak uh, because then the, this, these kind of patients can have uterine rupture later on during pregnancy. So always better to leave 0.5 to 1 centimeter of the septum if in doubt than to go overboard with the procedure. This is a case of lateral metroplasty being done in a case of Asherman's where we are creating the cavity. Uh, this surgery we do pretty often in patients who have very bad endometrium, have a restricted uterine cavity and uh, whenever we take them out for IVF, we are not able to get a nice endometrial lining. Uh, this procedure helps a lot. Create a space inside the uterine cavity. This is the Collins knife being used. Distinction media is um, glycine. Once we create the space, again as I said, the endometrium is regenerated on its own. And if it is a patient for IVF, we can definitely give these, uh, give the, these patients high dose estrogen and progesterone so that in every subsequent cycle they form a better endometrium. Many of our patients who had failed IVF after undergoing these procedures have had a successful pregnancy and delivery. So once we have two nicks on the lateral um, uh, walls and one at the fundus, if need be, create a space inside 
and believe you me the endometrium that forms after this is much better than what the patient originally had. See the nice cavity being created inside. Sorry, I'm facing a little problem here. That's what's stuck. Uh, Dr. Vishata, yeah. will you mind concluding? Sorry? <laughs> will you mind concluding the session? Uh, will you mind concluding the session? Uh, we are yeah, yeah, definitely sure. running too much behind the schedule. Okay, okay, okay. You know, I'm sleeping to my head. Another sector being the center. <laughs> but my talk is not complete. Should I stop it here, sir? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, probably because, you know, we have... Uh, not many uh, presentations waiting, so I think uh, and quickly okay, we can go over the question answer sessions. Okay. So. Uh, A brief on laparoscopy, just five minutes. Uh, yes. Madam uh, Doctor uh, <coughs> Vinesh Kansal will be speaking on laparoscopic and hysteroscopic myomectomy. No, no, I am not talking on uh, myomectomy. It is just the edition that I am talking. Okay, about. Madam. So please go ahead. Five minutes. <coughs> Now these are some of the laparoscopic procedures where the uh, first case of epistolysis. We do come across such cases pretty often in our day to day practice. Sharp dissection is the, with the scissors is the preferred one. Always keep the area that is to be resected on traction and then go in the right plane. Majority of the time, the tissues, they give up in the right plane itself. Another bad pelvis. So basically, edusolysis is the procedure that we very frequently do. Another case of endometriosis, both the ovaries being stuck in the center. After doing the adhesiolysis, we normally put interseed, which is an addition prevention barrier. This is the interseed being put, which will uh, prevent addition formation. Now, this Dr. Kansal, I think, would be taking hysteroscopic, uh, laparoscopic myomectomy. This is a case of a variances technique. Incision, enucleation, hemostasis, three steps. This is the stripping of the cyst wall being done. Now this is a big ovarian cyst where you do the direct ovarian puncture. Aspirate the contents. Now case of endometriosis, which is now the gold standard for uh, Laparoscopy has become the gold standard for endometriosis treatment. Once we clear up the pelvis, we normally prefer telling the patient to try for conception as soon as possible. Again, addition, adhesiolysis, cystectomy, and application of interseed. This we are doing the colpotomy to take out the tissue, the cyst wall. This is normally we do at places where we don't have the morselate <coughs> we do corpotomy to take out uh, either the fibroid or the ovarian cyst. This is a morselation for uh, fibroid. A case of fibroplasty. Where we are dilating the fibria. This is done for mild to moderate cases of hydrosalpins. Nice fibria has diverted out, and you can see the dye coming. Now this is a case of neosalpingostomy where we are creating a new ostium. This is done for cases of severe hydrosalpins. Give an incision at the fibrial end, make the opening, dilate it. It has to be a cruciate shaped incision. Dilate the 
newly created opening, Ebert the Fimpi out, <coughs> and a little coagulation to keep it everted. See the Fimpi has come out. And dye is flowing out. Again, another case of neosalpic costume. Thank you. Medication like uh, estrogens or a uh, lot of people give either mesoprost tablet, they keep it in trouble. They're not doing it. Okay. If it is something, if it is a patient I know is of very small cervix and a very tight os, then maybe they put. Yeah, intravaginal visa process. Otherwise, for majority of the cases, it is not done. Please give a mic to the delegate. Dr. Jus, please give a mic. Yeah, very nice lecture. Thank you very much. I'd like to use hysteroscope. You can use bipolar probes. Yes, bursascope is available where we use bipolar current. Okay, can you use that for... Uh, Definitely we can use that. Resection. But with bursascope, the vision is very much restricted. And it is a ringer lactate or saline when we are using uh, versascope. Okay, thank you. Because that is a bipolar current. Yeah, thank you. But not with the routine hysteroscope. This I'm talking about but, the routine things that we... But for major sur uh, hysteroscopic surgery, you prefer uh, uh, to use... Uh, the 4mm telescope and the resectoscope. Okay. Because the vision is much bigger and it is easier, <coughs> especially if it is a big fiber. Okay, thank you. Please give the mic to the audience. I was asked what is my opinion about giving Lupride depot before doing uh, myomectomy. Uh, that should never be done because Lupride depot it shrinks the size of the fibroid and also it becomes difficult to chip off the fibroid. The fibroid becomes more rubbery. It definitely becomes smaller but it also becomes more rubbery and it is very difficult to resect it. And at times we lose the plate. If it is a uh, uh, giving Lupride depot in a patient where it is a very, very big fiber. Still understandable that you are shrinking the size. Otherwise, as a routine, it should not be done at all. Thank you. Uh, thank you.